but if you have your Bibles and you're in the sanctuary with us this morning, Jeremiah chapter number 38 is where we're going to be in just a moment as you're turning there. Uh, we are going to uh, revisit uh, a passage of Scripture that we have ministered on uh, in times past. And uh, I'm going to not re-preach or reteach, but I am going to revisit a few things that, that I have said so that we can just make sure that all of us are on the same page. But then I'm going to take this story a little further uh, because I believe that there is something very unique in this time frame that we find ourselves in. And this morning, you're going to hear me talk about three individuals uh, more so than anything. You're going to hear me talk about a man by the name of Jeremiah. You're going to hear me talk about a man by the name of Ebed Melech. What a name. And you're going to hear me talk about Zedekiah, the last king of Judah. So these are the three, three men that is going to be addressed uh, throughout this message today. We know uh, that uh, Ebed Melech is uh, quite the character. He comes on the scene unexpectedly in the book of Jeremiah. He, he's only in scripture for a brief moment of time in chapter number 38, as well as then you see him mentioned again in chapter number 39. The, bu the book of Jeremiah is dealing with the prophet Jeremiah, and therefore we know that he is the main character uh, or the main individual, I should say, throughout this book. As well as we know that Zedekiah, he is a king, uh, the last king of Judah, uh, before it is destroyed, and we know that he is a man uh, that does not uh, follow the word of God or the will of God, even though he desires to hear what God is saying. So I, I want to share that with you this morning, and hopefully we can tie all of this together uh, uh, for where we are now. Uh, I want to talk to you today about really the reemerging of the prophetic voice uh, but for a few moments, I want to preach if the Lord would help me. And I pray that you would pray for me as I try to deliver this this morning. But we're going to preach for a few moments on breaking the silence. And if you have your Bibles, Jeremiah chapter 38, if you're able, if you're not able, I'm going to ask you to stand and honor the word this morning. But if you're not, I understand. Uh, but beginning in verse number two, and we're going to read down just a little bit. And then we're just going to allow the Lord to lead us this morning. It says, Thus saith the Lord, He that remaineth in this city shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. But he that goeth forth to the Chaldeans shall live, for he shall have his life for a prey and shall live. Thus saith the Lord, This city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. Therefore the princess said unto the king, We beseech thee, let this man be put to death. Talking about Jeremiah. For thus he weaketh the hands of the men of war that remaineth in this city, and the hands of all the people, and speaking such words unto them. For this man seeketh not the welfare of his people, but the hurt of them. Then Zedekiah the king said, Behold, he is in your hand. For the king is not he that can do anything against you. Then took they Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon. And then we find that they let him down with cords because it was so deep. And it says in this dungeon, or you can say in an old cistern, there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. Verse number 7. Now when ebed Melech the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs which was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon, the king then sitting in the gate of Benjamin, ebed Melech went forth out of the king's house and spake to the king, saying, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon, and he is like to die for hunger in the place where he is. For there is no more bread in the city. Then the king commanded ebed Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Take from hence thirty men with you, and take up Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he die. 
So Ebed Melech took the man with him, took the men with him, and went into the house of the king under the treasury and took thence old cast cloths and old rotten rags, and let them down by cords into the dungeon to Jeremiah. And Ebed Melech said unto Jeremiah, Put now these old cast cloths and rotten rags under thy armholes, under the cords. And Jeremiah did so. So they drew up Jeremiah with cords and took him up out of the dungeon. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence in this room. We thank you for the men and women in this room as well and those that are joining us by way of live stream today. Lord, I pray that for the next few moments that you would anoint this vessel, (coughs) Lord, to speak your word. Not my opinion, not my ideal, but Lord, that which you have placed in my spirit over these last few days in our time alone together in your word. I pray that there would be an anointing for us to hear, an anointing for us to receive, as well as an anointing for us to respond accordingly to that which you're calling us to. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church says, amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. Allow me to begin by simply saying that we find ourselves in a season where it seems that there is great uncertainty, not in a few places, but around the globe today. And I believe that This is an hour in which it has never been more important for the church of Jesus Christ to stand up and to be present in the world in which we live. Not to be men and women of conflict, but to be men and women of truth. To be men and women that stands in a manner where they are unshakable in the fact of the word of the Lord being true in their life. It is clear, however, this morning, and we are beginning to see this in a manner that we've never saw it in our lifetime before. It is clear, however, that for those who would dare and stand up in this hour for that which is right, for that which is moral, and for that which is in alignment with God, it is potentially going to cost them greatly for their stand. Now, that should not discourage us, but that should motivate us this morning. And I pray that we will have an ear to hear today. I don't come with a message of doom and gloom this morning. However, I do come with a message that hopefully will challenge us to stand for truth. I declare to you today, without hesitation and without reservation this morning, that we are getting ready to witness the arrival of the most prophetic season since the arrival of Jesus himself when he was placed in a manger. It had been talked about, prophesied for years that there was a Savior going to be born. He was going to be the the one that is the Savior of the world. And it was noised and it was discussed and it was talked about by many. And many said, oh, it will never happen because it's not happened by now. But one day, there was a virgin by the name Mary that was great with child. And she placed a little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And wise men came from afar. And shepherds that night came and saw this baby they named Jesus. And there was a proclamation in the heavenlies that said, he has arrived. Now that was pretty powerful then. But you have to remember that when he left, he said, it is expedient that I go away. That the Father will send he the Holy Spirit. But he says, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. But he's going to come and he's going to walk with you. And he's going to empower you. He's going to equip you. And he's going to fix it where you can be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. But it doesn't stop there either. But 
He also said this before he left in John 14. That if I go, I will come again. And I will receive you unto myself. Can I tell you that in Acts chapter number 2, when Peter stood up and said, these men are not drunk as you suppose, seeing as but the third hour of the day. But this is that which the prophet Joel spoke of. That was a little better than 2,000 years ago. And can I tell you, that was the beginning of the last days. So now we are no longer in the beginning of the last days, but we are in the fleeting final moments of the last days. So that means this, that the return of the Lord is nearer now than it's ever been. So there is a prophetic word in this hour that we are to look up for, Paul said, our redemption draws nigh. He even said, it's even nearer than when you first believed. So I say that to say this. I know that there are those that have no desire to hear that we are in a time of biblical fulfillment. However... I also know that we have a generation that is more focused on the present than eternity. However, I also know this, that no matter what men may say, think, or do, or what they have an appetite for, when God puts things in motion and a man or a woman comes into alignment with that which he is speaking concerning an hour, there is nothing Tell your neighbor, nothing. There is nothing that can overpower his authority. So there's a lot of people walking around flexing their muscles and trying to bust open their shoulders and their shirts and saying, oh, we got all power and all authority. But the only power that men have is the delegated authority that God allows them to have. But in this season, uh, we have forgotten uh, that there is a supreme being. Uh, And I just want to say this this morning. uh, It's not Allah or any other man-made God. uh, But it is still uh, God Almighty. uh, And it is still he that is sitting on the throne this morning. Uh, There is nobody dethroned him. Uh, There is nobody that's took his place. Uh, And can I tell you, that should make us excited today day uh, because sitting on the right hand of the father uh, is that baby that once laid in a manger that is no longer a babe uh, and he's still making intercession uh, for you and I. Uh, So listen, uh, we have a representative in heaven right now for us. Now, I could preach on that this morning, but that's not my message. Uh, So I got to keep moving. Uh, We see in our text this morning, uh, Jeremiah, the man of God, uh, that willingly became the prophetic voice, uh, encountered uh, great resistance. Uh, How many knows that when you stand for truth, you're going to find resistance? We don't like it, but that's the reality of it this morning. Can I tell you? The resistance was mounted because the message uh, that was been delivered uh, was not one that they wanted to hear. Uh, Can I tell you, sometimes uh, you just have to push through. After looking closely at this event in history, however, I can understand the reason why there was such resistance uh, to his message. Nobody, not even anybody in this room today, wants to hear that you're about to be destroyed. Does that make you feel good and excited? Hey, you're about to, you're about to just get beat down. You're like, I don't want to receive that. Somebody tell you that this morning, your response was probably like this. I speak against that in the name of Jesus, right? Nobody wants to hear that. But we see in this previous chapter, chapter number 37, that the king, Zedekiah, his servants, And the people of the land, they all refused to hearken to the word of the Lord. However, when they saw the Chaldeans come up against them, the king, who refused to do the will of the Lord, the first thing he did, he sent for Jeremiah the prophet. Kind of bizarre, right? We see a lot of things like that happen in our day today. It's amazing that when disasters happen, 
trouble happens. You'll hear our elected leaders that haven't been in church since they was 15 probably, some of them. And they'll come out onto the podium in front of the nation and they'll simply say, pray. They all want to know what God has to say in the time of trouble and disaster. Notice, Jeremiah 37 and 3 says, Zedekiah the king sent some men and he simply said this, to Jeremiah, this is, the, this is the message that he delivered to him in verse number three. Pray now unto the Lord our God for us. Our God? How can it be your God if you're not willing to walk in alignment with his word, with his statutes, his commandments? But Zedekiah says, oh, pray to the Lord our God for us. Jeremiah did that which was requested of him, been a man of God. He said, I'll petition the Lord, and I'll see what the Lord says concerning this hour. But while Jeremiah did that which was requested, while he was making his petition to heaven, there was things happening in the natural realm, and I think it's worth mentioning this morning. Pharaoh had brought up his army out of Egypt when he saw that the Chaldeans had come to Jerusalem and had encircled the city. They had besieged the city. Meaning this, they would strategically position themselves and they was getting ready to overrun Jerusalem. They was getting ready to take it. But the Pharaoh of Egypt, he said, "Mm, I don't think I want them to do that. So he brings an army of people up to join with King Zedekiah and the army of Israel. Now, as they come and they join forces, don't forget the prophet. He's still in a way. He's petitioning heaven. God, what's a word for the people? And in the natural, Pharaoh and his army comes. And it appeared that things is getting better in Jerusalem. But when Jeremiah comes back, and I'll show you this in just a moment, in the midst of Pharaoh's army been present, and they're driving back the Chaldeans and they're wounding them. They've they brought great hardship against them. So much that the Chaldeans have retreated and are no longer circling the city. Jeremiah comes and says this. The Lord has a word for you. He says, all right, let's hear it. Chapter 37, verse number 7. says, behold, Pharaoh's army, which has come forth to help you. says they're going to return to Egypt into their own land. And the Chaldeans... They're going to come again, and they're going to fight against the city, and they're going to take it. What? We just beat them. We just wounded them. Oh, and by the way, they're going to burn it with fire. Thus saith the Lord, deceive not yourself, saying the Chaldeans shall surely depart from us, for they shall not depart. For even though you have smitten the whole army of the Chaldeans that fight against you, and there remaineth but wounded men among them... Yet you need to understand they're going to rise up every man in his tent and they're going to come and they're going to burn this city with fire. Now, what Jeremiah is saying totally goes against what they're seeing. It doesn't make any sense naturally. Because in the natural, we just absolutely slaughtered these boys. They're all wounded. And now the prophet comes and says, guess what? They're getting ready to come back. Your your reinforcements is going to go home. They're not going to stay here. And you're going to be by yourself. And those wounded men are going to come to their senses when they're in the tent. And they're going to come back. They're going to take this city. And then they're going to burn it with fire. And the reason for it is this. God was bringing judgment to his people because they had walked in disobedience for year after year after year. And God said, listen. It can go one or two ways when you read Jeremiah 38. The prophet tells them, says, you can retreat, you can surrender, and your life can be spared. But either way, the city's going to be destroyed. But if you choose to stand and fight, it's going to cost your life. It's going to cost your family, your daughters, your wives are going to go through some great hardship, and they are going to be treated very badly. But it's up to you how this city falls. Now, after Jeremiah delivered this message, he, goes to, he begins to go to the land of Benjamin. Stay with me. I know I'm laying a foundation this morning. It'll get good at the end if you just stay to the end. 
And he separated himself from the people. But as he began to walk, and he began to go towards the land of Benjamin, in Jeremiah 37, 13 through 16, you find that when he got to the gate of Benjamin, there was a captain of the ward that was there that falsely began to accuse Jeremiah the prophet and say, you're falling away to the Chaldeans saying this, you're deserting us. You're going to go join with the enemy. And he says, not so. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to the land of Benjamin. But he would not believe him. He brought him before the others. And therefore the princes was very wroth with Jeremiah because they believed a lie against him. Notice what they did to him. They smote him and they put him in prison. They put him in the dungeon. And it says that he was there for many days. In verse number 16. However, during this time, we see that the Chaldeans began to regroup. We see they began to position themselves. And they began to make Zedekiah the king somewhat nervous again, obviously, because in verse number, in chapter number 37, verse number 17 through 21, Zedekiah secretly calls for Jeremiah and brings him to his house. And he says this, is there any word from the Lord? Asking, has the Lord changed his mind concerning what you said before? Is it, is it we're going to have an ice cream social or something instead of having our city burned? Is it, is it God going to favor us with something? And Jeremiah said, there is a word for you. And it's the same thing that we said before. He said, thou shalt be delivered in the hand of the king of Babylon. Saying, you're, you're, it's going to fall. But then Zedekiah, he said, he said, I, I just can't respond because I'm fearful of what others may think or do around me. But during this conversation, Jeremiah said, why is it that you have me in a dungeon? Why is it you have me in a cell? I've not done anything. And the king said, bring him to the court of the prison. Which then brings us to where we started this morning. Jeremiah has been falsely accused. He's been in prison. He's been in a cell. Now he's secretly called to King Zedekiah's house. He petitions for his release but does not get released. But he says, I'll at least let you come to the court of the prison. You're not going to be in solitary confinement, so to speak. But you're going to have freedom to move about. And the prison that they had was a makeshift prison. It was made out of Jonathan's house in that time. And therefore, he's moving around the court. And in the midst of this, he begins to speak again what we read in chapter number 38. He refused to be silent, and he begins to continue to speak the word of the Lord, informing them that was there, the people of the city as well as the soldiers, that you're getting ready to taste defeat like you've never tasted before. It enraged these men in such a manner that they took Jeremiah and did not remove him and put him in a cell again, but they removed him and put him down in an old cistern that was empty. Obviously very deep because they lowered him down with ropes. So they didn't just set him in there. They lowered him down. And as they lowered him down in there, there was no bread. There was no life. But it says that he sunk in the mire. Now, the only place that you see Eben Melik throughout Scripture, he comes on the scene unexpectedly. And as he comes in, he realizes that these men have done evil concerning the prophet of God. We don't know a lot about Ebed Melik, but we do know a few things. Number one is this we know that his name means servant of God or servant of a king. That is the definition of his name. We know that he was an outsider. He was not a Jew, but he was an Ethiopian. And we don't know how he got where he got, other than we do know this that he gained influence with the king. We also know this, that he was a eunuch in the house of Zedekiah, meaning this, he was a man that not only was present, but he had the ear, the eye, and the trust of King Zedekiah. Can I tell you, you don't just get that, you earn that. So obviously, we know that Ebed Melik was a man of character. He was a man of influence. He was a man of integrity. 
And we know that it's apparent that he was also a man of courage because when he walked in and he saw what they did to Jeremiah the prophet, he immediately goes to the gate of Benjamin and addresses it to the king. And the king says, take 30 men, go pull him back up out of the dungeon. I believe it because it's probably safe to say that Ebed Melek was not concerned with himself, but he was concerned with the appearance of the king. He was loyal to the king. And I believe what he was saying is this, king, do you realize that this is on your watch? And do you really want it to be on your record that they put a prophet in a cistern and he died under your authority? He was simply saying, that's not going to look good for you. That's not going to look good on you. And he said, you're right. Take 30 men. Go bring him up out of the mire. But notice, something happens. Ebed-Melech, when he leaves the presence of the king and takes the men with him, he makes a stop along the way. He goes to the king's house, to the king's treasure, and he pulls out old rotten cloths uh, and rotten rags. Now, that may mean nothing to most of you in this room, but I pray that I can help it mean something to you in just a moment. Because what it is, is simply, it is a place, it is a drawer, or it is a floor underneath the wardrobe of the king in that moment. And it is garments that he has worn in times past. Our previous kings have worn in that kingdom and they have been reserved and they have been, they have been prepared and, and they've kept there because a king has an ultimate wardrobe. We don't have to wear the same thing twice, so to speak, like some of you ladies, uh, you know, and uh, like a king has all of this stuff, but his garments is different than the garments of everyday men and women because his garments are not just sold together with needle and thread but they're sold together with 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 gold and those types of things and and this these garments are made of strength and, and durability and we find that he realized in order for me to get the prophet out from where he is uh, I've got to have something that is strong and powerful uh, that will withstand uh, the, the the force that is going to be required for us to bring him back to the surface uh, and therefore he realized that it wasn't going to be a wardrobe of an everyday individual, uh, but there had to be some strength to this thing. There had to be some, 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 some life to this thing. So he went into some garments that was no longer been used. And some theologians say this, that what he went and got out of was formerly, possibly uh, a robe that King David had wore. I'm not sure if that's correct or not. Uh, others believe uh, that it could be traced back even further further uh, to other men that had been passed down, uh, that had been conquered through types of war uh, and things of that nature. Uh, Some say it could even go back as far as even to Adam, uh, that it could have been a garment that he wore. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, but the reality is uh, that it was a garment uh, that was fit for a king, uh, and it was something that they took out of, and they lowered it down, and we see that Ebed-Melech begins to give instructions to Jeremiah the prophet, uh, and he simply says, I want you to take this garment, uh, and I want you to put it under this arm, and then put the cord under that, because we don't want to bring any harm to you. We don't want to mess anything up. So we find that the men and ebed Melik, uh, they lower the cords down, lower the garments down, and they begin to pull. Uh, and they pull him out of the mire, and they bring him to the top, uh, and they find that he's there. And now while he's there, there is all kinds of things going on. But we find that something happens. The prophetic voice that everybody wanted to do away with and not hear anymore has now resurfaced and can be heard once again. King Zedekiah, I told you a few moments ago, had called for him out of prison and called him to his house secretly and said, has the Lord said anything? 
But this time we find that after he is brought out of the cistern, after ebed Melech and the men have brought him to the surface with kingly garments and they have positioned him there, we find that it was just shortly after that the king once again sends for Jeremiah. But this time he does not bring him to his house. Notice, he brings him to the third entrance of the house of the Lord. Can I tell you this, mor- this morning, ebed Melech realized that there was a need for Jeremiah to be on the surface. However, he knew he could not do it within himself. And therefore, he goes to the house uh, of the king's treasure and gets what is needed. But notice, as he brings him to the surface, then Zedekiah In chapter 38, verse 14, says unto the prophet as he brings him into the entry of the house of the Lord, he says, I will ask thee a thing and hide nothing from me. The king said, what is the Lord saying? Eben Melek, been a man, been human, said this, if I tell you what the Lord's telling me, you're going to have me killed. And he said, I promise I'm going to do no harm to you. But Eben Melek stood up and he spoke and when... Everybody else was saying, shut up. The prophetic voice of the Lord rose up and was sustained and was ushered back into the house of the Lord where it belonged. Notice this by an evil king. I come simply to tell you today that it's time for you and I to quit looking in the natural and say we can't or we shouldn't. But we should come and realize this, that God is doing something very unique in this moment of time. When I looked at this story in recent days, I began to have a stirring in my spirit. And I'm just going to keep you just for a few more moments. But I began to realize that in recent years, we have seen something parallel to this story. It was a few years ago, we began to hear the prophet began to speak words very loudly and clearly. A word that was not popular, a word that people didn't want to hear. It was a word that judgment was coming if we did not do certain things, such as fall on our face and repent. And we find that it wasn't the resistance so much coming from the world, but the resistance to that word was coming from those that are walking around saying that we are Christian. Can I tell you, well, just because we walk around in a religious manner does not mean that we are in a safe place. But there began to be such a resistance. Uh, and then we began to see people uh, in leadership in the church world uh, that began to speak against the word. Uh, and what they did, they began to denounce the prophetic word of God and said, that's not us. Uh, and, and we don't want that here. Uh, we don't, we don't, we're not part of that. That's a radical element. And what they did not know uh, is spiritually speaking, uh, they took the prophetic voice of Jeremiah that was arising in this hour uh, and they put it in a cistern uh, and the prophet's been sinking in mire. Uh, so to speak uh, because because of the resistance please hear me uh, there's a lot of men and a lot of women that have a prophetic calling on their life uh, that over the last two years have set silent uh, because of the resistance uh, because fear was trying to come upon them and they said well if we say that uh, then it's going to cause all kinds of conflict uh, but what they did not know uh, is that there uh, in the spirit realm uh, began to be the arrival uh, of an Ebed Melech. Uh, Can I tell you the remainder of this year is going to be different uh, than any other time in history Uh, because can I tell you in the midst of what's been happening There has been men and women uh, that's been pushed to a place of prayer. uh, And as they've been going to a place of prayer, uh, God has begun to do a work in their life. uh, And as they begin to do a work in their life, there's begun to be a spirit of boldness that's begun to rise up. uh, And that spirit of boldness is what I'm going to call this morning. uh, It is a spirit of Ebed Melek. uh, It is the resurfacing or the rearriving of Ebed Melek. Ebed Melek is a picture of the Holy Ghost. uh, When you 
walk it out. Uh, and God's saying, I will not leave my people comfortless. Uh, but in this season, I am allowing ebed Melek to arise again. Uh, and his arrival uh, is not coming so you can have a good church service. Uh, but the arrival of ebed Melek, I'm going to preach this thing while you sat there this morning. Uh, while ebed Melek comes, uh, can I tell you, his sole purpose uh, is to come back. Uh, and he's not coming back empty-handed. Uh, but the Lord has given him all that he needs. Uh, and he's coming back with some garments that belongs to the King of Kings uh, and Lord of Lords. Uh, and he's about to let down some cords. Uh, and there's about to be a prophetic uh, voice begin to come back to the surface. Uh, I declare to you today uh, that the prophet uh, is about to be heard again in this nation. Uh, and there's about to be a coming up. Uh, and the silence is about to be broke. Uh, and Eben Melek uh, is instrumental uh, in bringing this to fruition. Now, why is this important? Is as we find that Ebed Melech moves and he ushers in Jeremiah, all of a sudden, please hear me and don't miss this. King Zedekiah, a man that does not honor God, a man that does not acknowledge God, uh, but a guy that wants to hear what God is saying. Uh, he is the one. It wasn't the preacher. Uh, it wasn't the pastor. Uh, it wasn't the evangelist. Uh, but it was the one most unlikely uh, that sent uh, and ushered uh, the prophet uh, back into the house of God. Uh, can I tell you this morning uh, that the activity uh, of evil men, uh, they think they have power, uh, they think they have authority, uh, but God is setting them up uh, and what they don't realize uh, is their behavior uh, is ushering back in the prophetic voice uh, to the house of God uh, and God's about to speak again uh, and there's a life uh, that's about to be turned upside down because of it. Can I tell you this morning, I'm hurrying. We have to hear what the Lord is saying. The king sent. He comes. He delivers the word. And when he delivers the word, things began to happen. For the sake of time, I will not read the story, but you can finish reading 38 and 39 and you will find that that which the prophet Jeremiah prophesied became real. It became life. Jeremiah was present in the court of the prison when the city was taken. But Jeremiah received no harm. But Jeremiah was not the only one that was present. And I believe this is important. But you find that when you read on a little bit, ebed Melech is mentioned in chapter 39 just in a couple of verses. That's the only time you'll see him in Bible, 38 and 39. After delivering that word to the king in the house of the Lord, Jeremiah's in the court of the prison, and all of a sudden the Lord gives him another download and says, I need you to go speak to ebed Melech. Now, as he goes and he speaks to ebed Melech, this is what the word of the Lord says in 39, 15 through 18. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Go and speak to ebed Melech. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Notice, this is the word of the Lord. It isn't the word of Jeremiah. This is say, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Behold, I will bring my words upon this city for evil and not for good. For they shall be accomplished in that day before you. He's telling him, you're going to see this happen. It's going to be before you. But I, the Lord, will deliver thee in that day, saith the Lord. And thou shalt not be given to the hand of men of whom thou art afraid. For I will surely deliver thee, and thou shalt not fall by the sword. But thy life shall be a prey unto thee, because thou hast put thy trust in me, says the Lord. I want to say this to you this morning. You're going to have to shake off the fear of being a man of God and a woman of God. And you're going to have to shake off 
that spirit of resistance that's coming against you and keeping you from being and operating the gifts and callings that God called you to. Because can I tell you, Jeremiah the prophet and Ebed Melech is the only two men that we read of that did not face and experience the judgment that was coming on the land. But because Ebed Melech put his faith and trust in God, he was sustained. And because Jeremiah willingly spoke the word of God and walked in obedience, even when it was hard, he was sustained. Can I tell you this morning, the breaking of the silence is what triggered the judgment for the nation. We are getting ready to come into a place where the silence is getting ready to be broken. Now, I'm not speaking doom and gloom today, but I'm going to tell you something this morning, that we are already under selective judgment. And the only thing that's going to keep you and your family from that judgment is walking in a place of obedience, being true to the Word of God, not being religious. You and I today need to understand the breaking of silence is, is something that is the trigger mechanism, so to speak, that is going to bring this last day harvest of souls. So it's not something that we have to be fearful of, but it is something we have to have understanding of. That's why I got to tell you this morning, I'm trying to hurry, is that you must never forget Psalms 91. You must quote that. You must live that. You must live your life according to it. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise of pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shalt thou trust. And you can read the rest of it. Paul said this. And this is what I want you to hear. You say, but, but preacher, is it really going to, but, but everything's good. You know, uh, I, I'm making more money than I've ever made. And, and my family's this and my family's that. Listen, don't let your natural eyes deceive you of the time that you're living in prophetically. Because we know this, uh, that there is times of opposition. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, 35, he said, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or swirl? He's saying this. He said, I, have, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come. My prayer today is this, that there would be a holy boldness come to you and I in this season. We have witnessed over the last few years the lowering down of a prophetic word in our country. Nobody wants to hear the words of correction and judgment. We've been... In, even witness those in the church community disregard it and denounce it. But I believe in the spirit this morning that Ebed Melech has arrived. I believe with all of my heart that he is beginning the process of raising a Jeremiah anointing back to the surface. And this Jeremiah anointing is much like the Elijah anointing. And there is a band of men right now in this nation and the nations of the world that has been going into the king's treasury and they have in their possession in this very moment kingly garments that's strong enough. The world would say, oh, those are outdated and those are no longer needed and those don't fit the, the fad of the day, but they don't understand how they're sold together. They don't understand what the heritage is with it. And these men have them. And we're about to witness the entrance of the prophetic voice back into the house of God. I am believing by the end of this year there is going to be complete reversal in many areas. So church today I say get ready. For there is truly a sound that's returning to the house of God. This sound that's coming as they come to the music this morning, this sound is going to cause men to tremble. 
this sound is going to cause darkness to loose its grip. This sound is going to cause babies to begin to worship. This sound is going to cause faith to arise. This sound is going to cause healing virtue to begin to flow. How do you know that to be true, preacher? Last Sunday morning, if he was here, and we anointed a prayer cloth and prayed over Miss Watson. I received a call from her brother on Monday afternoon, the following day. He said, Ron, I'm sorry I wasn't able to be in church with you yesterday, but I did watch it last night. And he said, I want to say thank you for praying for my sister. And I said, you're very welcome. He said, I want to give you an update, however. He said, we went in last evening and the doctors, they, they said they had her breathing on her own a little bit anyway, but they, they kind of woke her up from the coma that they had her in and she knew her name and she could move her hands and she could move her feet. And they said, they really don't know what happened, but they said today they're taking life sport and everything off of her and we know we have a long road to go and we're going to move her to another hospital and things but, but I just want you to know that we didn't have any hope but now we have hope because she's breathing she was alert she was responding to their commands when shortly before just a few hours before They was basically saying you need to prepare to go to the funeral home because she's not making it. Can I tell you when you're in the house of the Lord and he bed Melech's present and the prophetic voice and the prophetic utterance is present, there is nothing too hard for our God. You say, but preacher, how, how, how do you know that How can you stand and tell us that there's a prophetic moving and a prophetic utterance that's coming? I mentioned this earlier, but let me read just a portion of it to you, and I'm ending. In Acts chapter 2, verse number 17, Peter is up talking to the people in Jerusalem from all over the known world at that time. He has just told them that these men are not drunk, as you suppose, seeing as but the third hour of the day. But in verse 17, he says, Do you remember a prophet by the name of Joel who said these things? He said, This is what he spoke of, and you're seeing it. And there's an escalation of it in the latter part of this time. He said, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and noble day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There is a prophetic utterance that's coming. You see, what does that have to do with me this morning, Pastor? The word of the Lord is this, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. Every time the church has ever been addressed, you will find the seven churches of Asia Minor in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. John the Revelator was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. and He began to write, and at the end of every one of them, the word is said, he that hath an ear, let him hear 
what the Spirit says. The Spirit only speaks through a prophetic utterance. He doesn't speak of his own self. He brings the word of the Father and he speaks through a prophetic voice. He's about to speak and we must hear what he's saying because it is going to equip us to bring in the harvest. It may tell you to do something absolutely upsets the apple cart in your life. You may have a five-year plan. I hope you do. But I also hope that God just messes it up. Because that's just how he does it. And when we begin to radically follow Jesus, lives begin to be changed. As we stand all over the house this morning, I can look today, as many of you do, and it's easy to get distracted, and it's easy to get discouraged when you see everything that's going on in our world. I could probably pull up on one of these devices right now and read slaughter after slaughter after slaughter of individuals an hour and 15 minutes, hour and 30 minutes in any direction from where we're standing right now. Senseless violence against innocent life. I could also pull up on these devices and show you calamity after calamity around the globe. We could talk about devastation in all manners pestilence and disease and while those things are daunting and sometimes discouraging when you understand where we are prophetically we understand that it has the Bible been fulfilled because the heart of men is so evil there's nothing new under the heavens We've saw men digress into this place of darkness in history. As it was in the days of Noah. As it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. We have entered into those days. But this time it's going to be different, my friend. There's not a flood water coming. And there's not fire going to rain down like it did on Sodom and Gomorrah, but there is the exiting of the church because he's coming. I heard it all my life. Jesus is coming. Children, you better serve the Lord. Jesus is coming. I heard it all my life. But he's nearer now than he's ever been. You and I today, the church of Jesus Christ is the only thing that's holding evil at bay like it is right now. Think about the ultimate chaos the moment the church leaves. I don't want my family in that chaos. I don't want your family in that chaos. I don't want my neighbors to go through that thing. So what must I do? I must be sensitive to the prophetic voice of God. I must say, God, if you can use anything, use me. Let that spirit of ebed Melech rise up in me and let me be the one that helps usher in that prophetic voice for this time and let us take a world in this moment of time. I wonder if there's anybody in this room that will say, I don't care what the resistance may be. I don't care what the opposition may be. But I'm going to be one that helps usher in the breaking of the silence. Because can I tell you, it's breaking. 
And you might be under the sound of this voice this morning with this preacher. And you might be overwhelmed and you may have never even surrendered your life to the Lord as of yet. There's no time like the present. Because can I tell you, he loves you with an unconditional love. And he says, I'll go with you and I'll be with you. I'll be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. But maybe there's all kinds of stuff going on in your life. Can I tell you, you can't let the stuff dictate who you're going to be. But you're going to have to push through. Jeremiah kept on speaking. Maybe everything's good in your life today. I pray it is. But even if it is, there's a time right now where we need to be sensitive. And here's what I want you to pray this morning. Lord, I pray for the man and the woman that has been given the prophetic gift. All of us can move prophetically. I'm not saying that. But there is men and women that has a primary gifting to operate in the realm of prophecy. And I want you to pray specifically for them, even if you don't know who they are. Because there's a lot of false prophets out there, but there's some true prophets that God's getting ready to bring to the surface the remainder of this year. And the words that they're getting ready to have to speak is not going to be easy words. But they're going to be words that God honors. And they're going to be words that bring about an awakening and a revival to this nation, to the nations of the world. But we need to pray for strength for them. So this morning, as they begin to minister in song, if you don't know who Jesus is, I'm going to ask you to come. I'd love to pray with you and pray for you. Maybe you need a special need in your life today. We want to pray for you. Maybe you say, I just want to spend some time with God. You can stand, you can kneel, whatever. But before we leave today, I want us to pray. I know we got a lot of stuff going on this afternoon, but we're not too busy to take time to pray this morning. And we're going to pray over another prayer call today for a gentleman that has asked for that. But would you respond this morning if you'd say, you know what, I want to be part of the breaking of the silence today. No matter where you're at on the spectrum, but you say, I'm going to spend some time in prayer this morning with my church family. Would you come? As they minister in song. God bless you this morning. Hey everyone, uh, Cameron here from PTC Ministries. I'm so glad that you could join us today uh, for the message here. Uh, I hope the message touched you uh, in a personal way and that you could take that and mold that and move it and let it move you in your life. And as you can continue your walk with Christ, continue your walk with us as well. Follow us, uh, click in the link below in the description there. Follow us on all of our social media platforms. And don't forget to uh, like and subscribe. Uh, I feel like a YouTuber here, but don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel to uh, stay connected with us. Um, and thank you for joining us.